Welcome to The Unlist. Today, I want to have a conversation about sweetness as it pertains to perfume. The reason why I'm mentioning sweetness, making a video about sweetness, is we are in the, uh, I guess, last quarter of the year, if you will. We're at the back part of the year now. We're heading into fall and then soon winter and the holiday season will be upon us. So people are going to begin reaching more and more for fragrances that are better in cold weather, more seasonal, and sweetness becomes a larger part of this conversation. It makes sense, therefore, to cover sweetness. Now, for some people, sweetness is just part and parcel, especially if you're someone who wears mostly modern fragrances made within the last 15 years or so. You're not going down the vintage rabbit hole and you're not doing uh, independent or artisanal or whatever stuff you're just buying what's at the counters you are probably very well acquainted with how sweet perfume is and for you specifically it might even be a preference because you are so used to it a fragrance without sweetness would be off-putting for you would be bitter would be sharp would be acrid would be weird right you are so used to the sweetness like someone who drinks American Cola with corn syrup you go over to Europe or down in South America or somewhere else in the world where they use regular cane sugar and the cola is not as sweet. So you think that's weird. Whereas in reverse, someone from those countries comes over here, they're used to natural cane sugar in their cola. They go drinking an American bottle of Pepsi or Coke and they're like, oh, this is so sweet. This is gross. Okay. That is the same problem that we see with uh, older and younger members of the online fragrance community. People who are in the Gen X generation and maybe a little further back, you know, boomers and stuff are included in this. Uh, they are used to fragrances that don't apply sweetness as the primary point. They're used to fragrances where sweetness is more like an after effect. Like you created a fragrance and you apply a bit of vanilla to smooth it over, to round the edges. Or you use a bit of lemon oil, like in Z14 by Halston, to sweeten up a little bit so it's not so pungent and sharp. That is how a lot of older people are used to seeing sweetness. Sweetness is kind of a finishing touch on a fragrance. You know, you put the vanilla in there to round off the florals and the musk profile, all right? The fragrance is seldom about the vanilla, okay? Very seldomly. and. Uh, you flip that around and you talk to younger people, people who wear fragrances mostly from the 2010s and up, and they're going to be like, yeah, it's all about sweetness. The sweeter, the better. I want it sweeter. I want it sweeter, 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 sugary. I want to smell like baked goods. I want to smell like candy. I want to smell like a chocolate bar. I want to smell like hot cocoa. You know, I'm here for it. And there's a very polarizing uh, interaction with people who are from opposite ends of that spectrum. You know, an older person who's used to like Bada Portugal comes across a younger cat who's wearing like arrows and he's like, oh God, you smell so sweet. What is with that? And meanwhile, the younger person is smelling the older guy and he's like, oh, you smell like, uh, you smell like aftershave, man. Gross. You know, it's just so sharp and, 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 and pungent and bracing. Like, what's up with that? And it's weird because we have this sort of generational divide kind of oil and water reaction especially in the online fragrance community. And whereas other notes and their inclusion in perfume have kind of evolved slowly over time, we've seen, you know, increasing prevalence of this or decreasing prevalence of that, you know, animalics on a very slow decline, for instance, since the 80s. But with sweetness, though, there's a very sharp uh, bell curve where, like, sweetness was kind of like this. And at one point, it just went whoosh and took off. And why is that? That's something that we should discuss. Before I begin naming any of my uh, favorite sweet fragrances, I will do a, a little unlist where I talk about what my favorite sweet fragrances are. But let's talk about why that is, first and foremost. Now, this is just kind of an analogy I'm giving. This is no offense to anyone's religion, but we can almost look at the uh, advent of sweetness in perfumes the same way we look at like the Roman calendar which has a Christian influence on it so you've got the before Christ or BC and then the after death or the AD and that year zero 
I guess, where Christ was crucified. That's, that's, that's the beginning right there. Okay, so we can look at that, uh, that line in the sand as being the advent of a particular well-known fragrance called Angel by Thierry Mugler. I think 1992 is when that came out. Angel uses a material that was up until that point better known for flavoring things than scenting them. And that material is ethyl maltol. Ethyl maltol is a material that some of you who grew up chewing like bazooka gum, your traditional pink bubble gum, you will notice that ethyl maltol uh, is kind of harkens back to that. It reminds you of chewing bubble gum. And that's why a lot of people will say fragrances with a very large amount of this material smell like bubble gum, like Paco Rabanne Invictus, for example. Everyone says, oh, it's very bubble gummy, okay? So that is because that particular material was used in bubble gum and still is used in bubble gum. But it crossed over. It crossed over from the confectionery world to the uh, fragrance world with the release of Angel. And Angel also uses another material that's less known called Helonial. And Helonial has this sort of hot air metallic musk profile. And when you mix that with the ethyl maltol, it gives you the uh, illusion of like fresh spun cotton candy. And that cotton candy was one of the focuses of Angel, you know, along with the florals and other stuff. It was recognized as the first gourmand perfume, right? So if you look at that BC AD analogy here with year zero being the release of Angel by Terry Mugler, everything from Angel onwards has been just this rocket ride of how much ethyl maltol can we cram into a fragrance. And it's not always with the intent to make it sweeter, like aesthetically. It's because ethyl maltol is also a good booster. It does like what Ambroxan does and ISOE Super does, where it really pushes volume of sillage very well. So sweetness ends up being a side effect in that case, not the intent. And you just kind of have to deal with it. You know, it is what it is. Take it or leave it. They don't care. Someone's going to buy it if you're not, right? So the ethyl maltol, much like a lot of other one trick pony fragrances out there, gets abused very heavily in fragrances meant to convey a lot of sillage and projection. So that's why you notice fragrances typically marketed to people who go out at night, you know, clubber fragrances, all tend to invariably be very, very sweet, you know. So, and uh, the thing about uh, very sweet fragrances is they are very loud. You don't really get subtle sweet fragrances, do you? If you get a very, very sweet fragrance, it tends to be cloying. And we learned that way back in like the late 80s with stuff like Lapidus Porum by Ted Lapidus, which didn't use ethyl maltol, by the way. It had a lot of orange blossom in it. That's how it was so sweet. It had a lot of orange blossom in it. We would see that again with uh, Yope Ohm by Parfums Yope by Wolfgang Yope. Very, very sweet fragrance. Okay, and then Lamal would do it again. Although Lamal did actually use ethyl maltol in it, but not a ton, but a little bit. But the point is, sweetness doesn't always have to be conveyed with ethyl maltol. It's just ethyl maltol ended up becoming like MSG, okay? The flavor enhancer. So just like other things, Norlimbanol, Ambroxan, Isoe Super, like I said, a lot of these uh, very popular saffron materials now that turn up in a lot of fragrances, you know, very popular cashmere. Cashmere has been a while, around for a while, but my point is a lot of these aroma chemical boosters end up just getting liberally applied. And ethamaltol is one of those. Thus, the consequence is very sweet fragrances. Now, of course, you can't use ethamaltol and not know it's going to make your fragrance sweet. So there's a, there's a flip side to the argument that, okay, if I'm going to put a whole bunch of ethamaltol in my fragrance, I know it's going to be sweet. So you're not going to create like an aromatic sheep. You're not going to create, you know, uh, a fougere and go, oops, ethyl maltol. You're not going to do that because you know the result's going to be ruining your fragrance. It's going to ruin your perfume. So it's not like they're doing it ignorantly. <laughs> so, and of course, they also see that people are more and more into sweet fragrances now. 
So they are also kind of hand in hand with, hey, this is a cheap booster. It boosts the fragrance. And it's also in line with what people want, the tastes that people have these days of sweeter fragrances. And we can see that with fragrances, particularly like BR540, a unisex sales uh, miracle. You know, guys love it, ladies love it, non-binary folks love it, everyone loves it, okay? And uh, Baccarat Rouge 540, released in 2014, by Maison Francis Curjon, that fragrance has been a watershed moment for perfumery. And it really kind of gave proof of concept that people will accept very sweet fragrances. And since BR540, we have seen the envelope pushed, and some people may say, patience tested with the sweetness. You know, in particular, a lot of the more recent uh, Lamal flankers that I've done reviews on have been getting more and more sweet. And of course, there is stuff like black opium. On the women's side, there is uh, stuff like uh, Eros, Versace Eros on the men's side. So it's all over, it, it's everywhere. Now, as far as I'm concerned, I'm kind of indifferent about sweet fragrances, but I do have some that I enjoy and I will name them for you now. Okay, so probably one of the biggest sweet fragrances that I like is a 2003 fragrance, definitely a gourmand but it was released by uh, Liz Claiborne. It's called Spark for Men. And it has a sort of caramel, spicy, hot pepper mixed with like a bourbon element. It's almost like a boozy, sweet kind of gourmand fragrance with a tiny hint of like tobacco and leather. It's a very complex fragrance actually, but uh, it is sweet. So if you don't like sweet, you won't like it. Another one is going to be Devil's Share which is uh, an independent release from uh, Darren Allen Perfumes. I think I may have named Devil's Share in my fall video, so this is a, a double mention, but it, it, it too is a very sweet fragrance. I'm not going to describe it further. Go watch my fall fragrances video if you want to hear me talk about Devil's Share a little more, but it is a sweet fragrance. And then, of course, uh, there is Yope, uh, which Yope and its younger sibling, uh, Mont Blanc Individuel, both produced by the same perfumer. Uh, Yope Ohm was created by uh, Pierre Bourdon and Michael Amirak, whereas Mont Blanc Individuel, which is like I said, it's younger sibling, was just Pierre Bourdon by himself. But both fragrances kind of have the same structure, except Yope is a little more focused on florals and the uh, Individuel is a little more on spices. But both of them are very sweet fragrances. So once again, if you don't like sweet, you probably don't want to go near that. And then I do like some of the modern sweet fragrances. I know a lot of my older friends, a lot of my boomer buddies and my Gen X buddies can't stand, can't stand these fragrances, but I do own bottles of One Million and Eros. I do like them, I do wear them. My thing about very intensely sweet fragrances, like One Million, like Eros, is when you have a very intensely sweet fragrance, you need to wear it in the utmost cold weather imaginable. So if you're gonna be inside all day, don't wear it. If you're sitting by the fireplace, don't wear one million, don't wear Eros. But if you're gonna be out and it's like, uh, and I'm using Fahrenheit guys, so if you're Celsius, I'm sorry, but if you're outside and it's like 30 degrees out there and it's a cold wind, maybe there's even snow or frost on the ground, that is when you want to wear one million. That is when you want to wear Eros because in that really cold air where your beard's getting little frosties on it, that's when you want to wear a fragrance like that because the sweetness in those fragrances really does a great job of contrasting the cold air. And it brings out certain facets of that fragrance, you know, or, or of those fragrances that I think are most enjoyable. Whereas the intended purpose, you know, the marketing around One Million and the marketing around Eros, where you're supposed to go to a nightclub where you got a bunch of horny guys in there with popped collars dancing like this. And yes, they're dancing just like this, by the way. They're doing it with their arms. They're going like this in the clubs. And they're sweating their butts off. And they're dancing like this. And they're wearing a bunch of One Million. And they're wearing a bunch of Eros. And I'm like, God, it stinks in here, man. I just want to get like a fire hose and just hose them all down. I do. And I'm like, that, to me, that's the worst possible place to wear a fragrance like that. 
Like, why would you sit there in a nightclub and wear some BR540 while you're going like this, you know? Well, like, even something like Loam, YSL Loam, which I know that's Jeremy Fragrance's, like, favorite smell of all time. He, he wears tons of Loam, but same thing. He's in there in a nightclub going like this, right? And he's wearing a bunch of Loam, and I'm like, oh, my God, I just couldn't stand that. That would be too much for me. I feel like you got to wear those kind of fragrances in the cold. You got to wear them in the cold. Now, if you add some spices to it, maybe you can wear it in room temperature environments. So some fragrances that are sweet, okay, but they lean more on spices, that's okay. You can pull those off in a less than frigid environment. So if I'm inside, you know, if I'm having Thanksgiving dinner or I'm at someone's Christmas party or whatever I'm doing, okay, but I'm, I'm inside, then I can do something like a Burberry London, okay? I can handle a London. I can handle something like Tomorrow for Men by Avon, which is a very spicy gourmand amber, you know, something like that. Or like the, the men's version of Angel, just called Amen, okay? Terry Mugler's Amen. Those are fragrances I can wear inside, okay, during that time of year when it's not super cold out because they've got spices, they've got patchouli, they've got amber materials. They're not just, you know, sweetness hanging its butt out, okay? Sort of the similar deal with like more powdery sweet fragrances, fragrances that have more of a vanilla nutmeg structure, okay? Things like uh, Jaipur Om by Boucheron, you know, that is one that I can wear indoor and outdoor. Uh, you know, I can do, um, another one is like uh, Carlo Pignatelli. I can do Carlo Pignatelli inside or outside, okay? Uh, an Avon fragrance, once again, that comes to mind is Starring for Men, released in 97. Same thing. If you're putting some uh, Oris or Iris, uh, either one, Oris or Iris or Nutmeg or Sandalwood, and mixing it with the vanilla, mixing it with the sugar, the ethyl maltol, that powderiness contrasts with the sweetness and then I can be like okay I can get behind this Shalimar same way I can wear Shalimar you know inside but if we're talking strictly sweet so we're talking like the new Lamal elixir for example I got to be outside in the cold if I'm not outside in like 25 degree weather and it's not snowing outside I'm not wearing Lamal elixir I will only wear a fragrance that's that sweet if I can be outside. The same thing with a lot of Parfum de Marly fragrances. So Herod, Leighton, okay, the new Althair, all those fragrances are really sweet. Parfum de Marly fragrances, those kind of fragrances, I can only wear those outside in the cold. So if I'm not bundled up in like, uh, um, you know, freaking scarves and a heavy wool jacket, you know, I'm not going to wear Leighton because if I'm inside, it's called ugh, okay. Just my preference, personally. You guys may disagree. There you guys have it. The video on sweetness. You learned a little thing about it, and you learned some my, more of my opinion. <laughs> Let me know in the comment section what you think about sweetness. If you have any favorite sweet fragrances, also name them. This has been The Unlist. Thanks for watching.